Uh, Emma de Florencio. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you all for coming today and thanks also to uh, ICTU and Florence for their generous invitation and to the IMAF for hosting me. Um, from the outset, I should say that this, while a somewhat more exploratory piece, uh, builds on themes that animate my forthcoming book titled Infrastructural Attachments, Austerity, Sovereignty, and the Politics of Expertise in Kenya. Um, I'm happy to talk more about where this fits in that broader project, but here and with you today, I'm, um, I'd like to explore the analytic potential of the concept of Afrofuturism, uh, which is new to me, and I'm also not a media uh, studies scholar, so any and all feedback is, is most welcome. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I think I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes. It might be a little bit longer. Um, I hope that's bear, bear with me. And uh, I apologize also if the slides are a little bit um, blurry. I tried to figure out how to resolve that, but didn't seem to be able to. Okay. Reflecting on the relationship between technology and racial thought, Sociologist Alondra Nelson writes of a pernicious racist duality wherein, quote, blackness gets positioned as always oppositional to technology driven chronicles of progress, end quote. Technology on this framing operates as a stand in for white techno capitalism, an exploitative and violent force wrapped up in histories of slavery, colonialism, and expropriation. It is against this narrative that artists and scholars working across diasporic spaces have engaged the concept of Afrofuturism, a project that in part centers on seizing and creatively repurposing technologies. As actively existing and imagined technologies are seized, they are remade into an armature by which more desirable and often otherworldly futures are imagined and imaginable. Interestingly, Africa, when making an appearance at all in these cultural productions, is represented as an imagined space rather than as a historically constituted geography <clears throat> populated by culturally situated, politically active populations. Historians of Africa, for their part, have not done much by way um, of thinking through the concept of Afrofuturism nor how it might offer a framework through which to shed new light on the relationships among technology, colonialism, and future making on the continent. This is odd. If anything, the entanglement of whiteness and technological progress uh, gained much of its definitional strength precisely at the interface, to borrow a term from Jane Geyer that is, I think, felicitly, felicitously disposed towards the study of technology, of European and African societies in the period immediately following the abolition of the slave trade and through the years of colonial rule. Indeed, many of the themes explored by Afrofuturist texts and cultural productions would be familiar to historians of Africa. In what follows, I would like to suggest three possible avenues that Afrofuturism might open up. The first is the supposed opposition between blackness and technology. Evelyn Hammond names this the quote, myth of black disingenuity with technology. We might think here of Michael Adas's insights um, that colonial racism was undergirded by the ideology of quote, machines as the measure of man. As, is, as a response and second, black cultural producers and artists have undone this vision through innovatively reconfiguring technological things. As Mark Derry writes of African-American visual artist Ramelzy's work, the b-boy bricolage with its dangling fetish-like doll heads and its computator cobbled together from screws and wires speaks to dreams of coherence in a fractured world and to the alchemy of poverty. Deploying culture, re culture retrofits, Ramelzy refunctions and willfully misuses the techno commodities generated by dominant culture. And here are some examples of Ramelzy's work. <clears throat> This work of repurposing and remaking technologies, scholars suggest, is undertaken as a modality of future making. These themes of bricolage, of making do, and of functioning under conditions of cultural violence and material austerity, too, have long concerned Africanists. Here we might think, for example, of the work of Brian Larkin that exemplifies how the fragmented materiality of media networks shapes urban experiences in Nigeria 
or the work of Clapperman, uh, Clapperton Mahunga, who has shown how colonial officials appropriated Africans' knowledge of the tsetse fly to destructive ends. If the first position highlights an ideology that presents blackness as an anathema to the technological, the second highlights the active appropriation and reconfiguration of white technoculture. Bridging these two positions, I, I would like to suggest, is the daily practical work of remaking. As Nelson's account reveals, by undoing the opposition between blackness and technological things, we can begin to, quote, account for the centrality of Black people's labor and modernization and industrialization, as well as the historical truths of Black participation and technological development. Focusing on work, then, can offer the empirical grounds from which histories of technology, expertise, and colonial capitalism can be rewritten, revealing alternative narratives of techno-futurity in the process. It is with these themes in mind that I want to think with the concept of Afrofuturism, using material drawn from the corner of Eastern Africa, Kenya, and focusing on one particular technology, radio, or what came to be called radio, and I'll come back to this in the Kenya colony. And this talk mainly, uh, part of the material comes from, uh, from the 1940s, but the main focus is going to be on the government's protracted war against what it came to call Mau Mau. In May of 1956, Raphael Joseph Ngugi wrote a petition challenging his termination from the information department. He wrote, I highly and truthfully deny the allegations that A, I was drunk during Saturday night, either before or after our official duties, B, that Mr. Thomas the driver ever came to the van on that particular night after work and spoke to me on any matter, see that I slept with a girl in the van, nor did I ever have a girl in the van or in that place on that particular night. Ngugi's overtures were ignored by the administration and within a month he was issued a formal letter of termination. On one reading, Ngugi's petition is revealing of the strictures under which Africans and the employee of the information department worked. Indeed, the colonial state looked on anxiously at evidence of emergent socialities born of the world of colonial media. African information workers were to comport themselves with ascetic discipline. People's schedules both on the, and off the clock were closely monitored, as were their movements. And the administration put a whole host of regulations in place to ensure that African information workers do not put information office technologies to their own uses. Failure to conform to these regulations, even to be perceived to not to perceived to not conform to them, often led to dismissal, as Ngugi learned. And yet, we would miss much, I think, if we saw in this simply the strict regulations under which African information workers labored. These men were vulnerable, to be sure, but their vulnerability was at least matched by the threat of their power. This much the provincial information officer of the Rift Valley province conceded in his letter terminating Ngugi's appointment. In view of the posts you have been holding being one whereby the officer filling it is required to travel around the province without constant supervision, it must be filled with, by a man with a sense of duty and a sense of responsibility to this department. These men, in other words, retained a good deal of autonomy as they undertook their work. The nature of information work in the Kenya colony demanded it. Not only did listeners dismiss out of hand media that was obvious government propaganda with listeners responding to Europe European broadcasts with quote, only skepticism and suspicion, but native English speakers handle on vernacular languages was the subject of much derision. These men then were not simply cogs in the unwieldy apparatus of the information office. To the contrary, African knowledge workers, experts of both techniques and culture, critically shaped the world of colonial information as they actively retooled and perfectly tropicalized technologies, uh, to use the language en vogue in the period, the messages they bore, and as I will suggest, as they set to work constructing more desirable futures. Knowledge workers' capacity to mobilize the government network as they engaged in their own projects of future making turned on their relative autonomy, which was itself born of longstanding policies of colonial austerity. And, and this argument about the longevity of austerity is the kind of framework for the, for the book project. 
a dearth in state financing in conjunction with the state's aspiration of enacting hegemony on a shoestring demanded a nodal approach to broadcasting in the, in the Kenya colony. It was for this reason that radio arrived in, uh, radio in Kenya arrived in the lives of communities over the roadways and in a van rather than over the airwaves and in the home and here is a mobile information unit. But this had not always been the plan. Indeed, the colonial state had grand ambitions for radio broadcasting in the Kenya colony and beyond. As early as 1936, the colonial office argued that in the future, radio broadcasting would have a central role to play in securing an emergent developmentalist ethos. As the Committee on Broadcasting in the Colonies wrote, we envisage the development of colonial broadcasting not as an instrument of entertainment, but as an instrument of advanced administration for the enlightenment and education of the more backward sections of the population and for their instruction in public health, agriculture, etc. In the future, administrators imagined radio listening would be a domestic affair because, quote, private listening on personally owned sets in the house is the best form of listening. This was then a universalist vision of technologies, a vision that held technologies to be easily transposed to new spaces, having the same effect no matter where they were dropped down. In this networked future, government development initiatives would travel over the airwaves with centrally produced broadcasts from Nairobi reaching into the lives of communities living throughout the territory. To this end, during the war, Nairobi began running broadcasts for African communities in Kikuyu, Doluo, Kikamba, Luya, Luganda, Kinandi, Kisi, and Kiswahili. But administrators conceded that it would be, quote, a very long time before one can hope for the ideal of domestic listening to be reached in Africa, end quote. The issues were twofold. Not only were receiving sets out of the reach of the under-remunerated majority, but lack of investments in tandem with Kenya's unique material geography ensured that the network itself was insufficient, quote, failing to ensure satisfactory reception over considerable areas. The mobile unit was then <clears throat> at what I refer to in the book as a, an infrastructural prosthetic. It was a hybrid composed of the medium of a wireless receiving set attached to the van. Traveling across the countryside, this unit administrators hoped would mitigate the problems thrown up by the lumpy reach of the state, the, the van bringing government messages and entertainment to quote audiences, which would not otherwise be reached by the vernacular broadcast from the Nairobi station. Administrators then acknowledged that material constraints, both fiscal and techno technological, would make domestic listening over personally owned sets impossible. For all intents and purposes then, the mobile information van was radio in this period. It was broadcasting. This van was a tropicalized technology designed to bridge the gap between an emergent developmentalist ideology and the particular material world of the Kenya colony, again, shaped as it was both by Kenya's unique geography and by <clears throat> policies of colonial austerity. African knowledge workers and experts asserted their autonomy in the seams of this lumpy information apparatus. African knowledge workers and experts were saddled with myriad responsibilities. Technical experts were tasked with maintaining and rejigging imperfectly tropicalized technologies and for, negotiate, and for negotiating worn out parts, the material stuffs of these policies of austerity um, as they worked in the field. Their import notwithstanding, the role played by the men working in the service of the information office is regularly obscured in the colonial archive. This is not surprising. Colonial administrators routinely drew on a pernicious and durable represent on pernicious and durable representational practices that positioned Africa as a place without technologies, let alone technological expertise. We will recall here Evelyn Hammond's insights regarding the durable quote myth of black disingenuity with technology. Experiences in the field belied this myth. The safari journals of Arthur Champion, the first mobile operator in Kenya and a fastidious note taker offers a glimpse onto the daily creative work of African technical experts. In 1940, following a litany of complaints about the failures of non-tropicalized technologies, Champion reported with satisfaction that not a single show had been delayed. 
In a moment of clarity, he laid credit where credit was due to his quote, native driver who had jumped into the breach, end, end quote. <clears throat> Breakdown was a perennial problem that unit operators were forced to negotiate. It is perhaps no surprise then that the creative work of African technical experts emerges with greatest clarity in the context of failure. That the work of these men bubbles to the surface in moments of breakdown should not be taken as a reflection of the limited role that they played, I don't think. Instead, that their work crops up in the context of breakdown is precisely evidence of their critical function uh, in the day-to-day -day operations of the unit. These men, in other words, routinely jumped into the breach as they negotiated non-tropicalized technologies, worn out parts and perilous roads. Material conditions demanded it and technical work workarounds were essential. This was not simply the work of repair though, but the work of technological translation. And this work was by no means inconsequential and the perceived stakes of failure were high. As one colonial official, F.H. Knight, reported, absent the dedicated maintenance of African crew members, deterioration of equipment was inevitable, the results of which were, quote, obvious to the audience. Audiences were biting in their critiques of breakdown, seldom laying blame with the projector. Instead, audiences expressed their, quote, poor opinion of either the film, the projectionist, or the mobile generally, end quote. The daily work of African crew members then was essential to the developmentalist aspirations of the information office. Indeed, officials reports notwithstanding, these men were technologists who fine tuned their practice on the road. And this practice labor had rendered the crew expert translators of technological things. But the work of translation rarely leaves the initial unit unchanged. In the case of technical experts, technological translation required reconfiguration as crew members reshaped and rejigged objects of European manufacture, such as work in the end colony. These technical experts, to give some examples, routinely rejigged the Megavox speaker, changed worn out tires, tinkered with imperfectly tropicalized loudspeakers and amplifiers, tuned the wireless receiving set, Men managed the van engine generator and the Bell and Howell 16 millimeter projector, spliced together films when they broke and transformed bicycle inner tubes into film casings. It is against this material backdrop that we should interpret one officer's reflections when he wrote that the unit staff routinely undertook, quote, duties which one feels are much more responsible than their education warrants, end quote. Um, this work of translation, though, was not limited to technical experts. Their labors were matched by uh, the labors of African knowledge workers who were responsible for translations of another kind. African knowledge workers, those men responsible for translating government scripts into vernacular languages, conducting research with communities on the ground, reporting back on Africans' responses to government information work, and elucidating um, the situation in African locations were relatively autonomous, being, quote, in charge of the unit and responsible for the conduct of the show. The central importance of these men was directly related to their work of translation. And this work of translation was required in both linguistic and conceptual terms. Just as the unit's technical components were perennially subject to breakdown, so too were the messages the unit bore. Just as the unit's technical components required adaptation, so too the did the developmentalist vision on offer. In pursuit of this work of conceptual translation, the Kenya Information Office, or KIO, recruited African knowledge workers. While some reported that translator announcers took, took, quote, to broadcasting like a duck to water, others acknowledged that being an effective broadcaster was a skill. As Champion admitted, our demonstrations are dependent on well-read well introductions and intelligent and well-timed commentary. The goal was to create something unique, quote, something that was real African propaganda and not just an adaptation of mechanical European propaganda, end quote. The skilled work of translation required shuttling meaning across what colonial administrators and knowledge workers alike perceived to be divergent epistemological fields. Successful translation was difficult to achieve to be sure, but it was even more difficult to police. In 1940, the Advisory Committee on Information noted, 
quote, the information officer was dissatisfied um, with the vernacular broadcasts. He said that on the previous day, he had caused the Kikuyu script to be translated back into English, and this had revealed serious discrepancies with the English script, end quote. Carbon copies across scripts um, was impossible. Loose conveyance based on intimate knowledge was as necessary as it was threatening. The KIO, though, did not presume inter intimacy between information officers and would-be listeners. Intimacy, they believed, required active cultivation. To this end, African knowledge workers in the field were, quote, expected to make as many personal contacts as possible. By 1941, some 50 knowledge workers with a cultivated sense of situations on the ground had been appointed. These men were responsible for sending news from the districts to Nairobi, but also for evaluating how communities were responding to government messages. In assigning knowledge workers with a keen sense of the local, administrators sought to embed radio broadcasting in the particular milieu of, of the communities it hoped to address through the air. Claims to universality notwithstanding, it was clear that development was as much a kind of cultural as it was a technical project. Perhaps because of their experience with translation, missionaries in particular viewed radio as being an unsteady and volatile medium. Those among their ranks routinely expressed anxiety regarding the prospect of drawing on the labor of African knowledge workers and announcers. In coming to their conclusions, missionaries likely drew on their experiences working with African catechists and their intimate knowledge of the importance of innuendo, proverbial forms, and idiomatic sayings in shaping communication. Missionaries, in other words, understood the complexity and Janus-based nature of language, the ability for language to communicate cult cultural facts to listeners, facts that might be missed by European overhearers. Mobilizing local knowledge, all we're beginning to realize was a requisite, but it did not come without risks. Screening was strict. A number have been tried out, one report recounted. Many were outright rejected on political grounds. But even with these provisions in place, overhearers could never tell really what knowledge workers were communicating, nor how their messages were being uh, received. While these concerns are familiar, reflecting a more general sense of colonial paranoia or nervosité in, in Nancy Hunt's formulation, um, I think that colonial subjects' mastery of technological things was the object of particular concern. And administrators were not altogether wrong. Evidence suggests that knowledge workers did indeed leverage their status within the media arm of the state um, and mobilize colonial media itself to secure for themselves the most desirable outcomes in a range of disputes. Deftly moving between subject positions of loyal intermediary and the center of information worker and, as we shall see, Mau Mau supporter, these men cycled through the colonial hierarchy. Leveraging their positions to their own advantage, they sometimes undermined the colonial authority that underwrote their own while concurrently augmenting their power and their authority in domains largely illegible um, to the state. To enter into these domains of relative imperceptibility, we must pivot to the government's protracted propaganda war against Mau Mau and move to another archive, that of one such knowledge worker, Ambrose Wakadia. And maybe the question of archives and method is, is something we can discuss um, in the, in the Q&A. Um, Wakadia was born in 1928 to Christian parents who were early converts. From the beginning, he took up the role of mediator. His grandfather was furious at his son's conversion, which he saw as a betrayal of Gakuyu culture. Wakadia sought to ease these tensions. As the favorite of his grandfather, Wakadia felt responsible for, for facilitating a resolution between these two senior men. These biographical details are, are these biographical details are, I think, important. It was from his grandfather that Wakadia began to gain an appreciation for Gakuyu culture. It was from his father that he achieved high uh, educational status within an emergent colonial hierarchy. One might argue that these interpersonal experiences made Wakadia a colonial middle figure par excellence, but they also alerted him to the stakes of cultural forgetting. 
It destroyed families and broke down intergenerational connections. His father's conversion and relative affluence though um, were important in other ways. They brought Wakadia first to um, a church missionary society school and later in 1942 when he reached standard four to boarding school. Wakadia's relationship with his education was fraught. While he enjoyed history and agricultural courses, the teachers were harsh, terrible, he told me, beating us all the time. Following high school, Wakadia attended classes in pharmacology at the King George Hospital, but he was chased in his words for fighting with other students. Wakadia's mobile itinerary, though, enabled him to pursue his life's work. Indeed, it was due to his own unusual trajectory that he landed his position working at the Kenya Information Office in 1950. In this capacity, he fulfilled a myriad roles. Wakadia not only acted as the voice of broadcast, but also as a researcher. Later, he um, was the main editor of a newspaper directed at Kiambu communities, after which he opened the first information office in Moranga. In 1956, he was tasked with opening um, the Mount Kenya Broadcasting Station, where he started another newspaper. Reflecting these varied responsibilities and reflective of the nodal and lumpy infrastructural reach of the state, sometimes Wakadia was on the move, traveling with the mobile unit, at other times, he was more stationary, broadcasting from the Mount Kenya station. Men like Wakadia were both the voices and ears of the information arm of the colonial state, but they were also researchers and experts of culture, lay ethnographers whose knowledge the colonial state routinely mobilized as it fine-tuned its information apparatus. And it was through this work that he, Wakadia, gained his expertise and celebrity status as the authority on all things Gukuyu. Men like Wakadia then, critical translators and professional knowledge workers occupied positions of relative power. The colonial state viewed these men and the knowledge they bore with apprehension. As I hope to show in the, in the next portion of the talk, the state's reliance on Wakadia and people like him and people like him enabled um, knowledge workers to routinely repurpose colonial media technologies as they pursued their own vocations. In the case of Wakadia, his role as a researcher and broadcaster enabled him to engage in his own project of culture building and renewal, rendering new media technologies his prosthetics, extensions that he mobilized as he called to order new communities of listeners increasingly bound together by language and culture. And the language of culture came up very much in, in, the, um, in our interviews. When the fight against what the government referred to as Mau Mau began in the early 1950s, the administration set to work assembling a vast propaganda apparatus. It was clear to admin administrators that gaining a monopoly over propaganda would prove to be no easy task. They were well aware that theirs was not the only information network in oper operation. The task was to combat the inscrutable lines of what colonial officials referred to as the Bush Telegraph. Of the power of this parent network, the state was convinced. Don't accept to be lied to by the voice of those who call themselves leaders of the opposition one broadcast in Kikuyu advised. The work of men like Wakadia was critical to this mission. Both his knowledge of the vernacular and his knowledge of Kikuyu culture were essential assets to the state in its fight against Mau Mau. But according to Wakadia, often the same people generating cultural knowledge for the state's use were part of these vernacular infrastructural networks. So there were many communications networks, I asked him during an interview in 2014. There are many communications, he said. We didn't have telephones, but we used to communicate. Walking this fine line required careful calibration and nuanced man maneuvering. Wakadia, uh, for Wakadia, it was this work, work which required pivoting between two epistemologies that made him an expert propagandist in his rendering. Wakadia recalled the difficulty of reporting during Mau Mau which required knowledge workers ensure that, quote, both, under, both sides understood you well. This was a delicate dance, which turned on disseminating an ostensibly singular message that could be interpreted by each side according to their reigning epistemologies. The British needed to hear your broadcast and interpret them as loyal. 
As for Mau Mau Wakadia continued, we could say proverbs or idioms that communicated messages illegible to the British. He continued, to the Mau Mau, I will only give a single sentence, but it says a lot. It was in this way that you could make sure that, quote, Mau Mau was happy and that the British were happy. Wakadia no longer, or when, when I interviewed him, uh, no longer identified as a propagandist. But in those years, the tension was very high, he said, and information workers, quote, had to play it very well. To be a spy is not easy, Wakadia continued. It's not easy. This might have been a skill rooted in wordplay, but it was dangerous because you, quote, had to please uh, the government and you also had to please the Mau Mau. The government can kill you and Mau Mau can kill you. Under these conditions, the metaphorical, the idiomatic, the figurative became semi-protected domains of creative action. As literary critic Henry uh, Louis Gates Jr. reflects, quote, black people have always been masters of the figurative. Saying one thing to mean something quite other has been basic to black survival in oppressive Western cultures. The idiomatic was indeed a means of survival for Wakadia. I asked him if he remembered any of the prover proverbs he mobilized during this period. Of course, he said, I remember. I use them even today in broadcasting. In this, Wakadia sing signaled how his work as a propagandist was part and parcel of the return to culture, his words, that, um, that enabled him to become an authority on all things Gakuyu. Despite these dangers, Wakadia was emphatic that he enjoyed his role as a knowledge worker before independence um, was achieved in 1963. I enjoyed very much, I enjoyed broadcasting. From his position behind the microphone and in the field, Wakadia discovered and pursued his vocation as the preeminent, preeminent authority on Gakuyu culture. This was not a seamless task, Wakadia explained. Before he was able to establish intimacy and trust with his listeners, he had to translate the technological hybrid of the unit itself. When people first saw the unit, he told me, people didn't like it, not from the beginning. As he explained, it was a new thing to us. We were not coming across those things. They were done by Europeans. His opinion changed in 1950 when he joined the unit and quote, saw it was a good thing. Media technologies were part and parcel of colonial technoculture. It was only through their appropriation and repurposing that they could be stripped of their association with colonial violence and put to, at least according to Wakadia, other novel ends. What Wakadia found most satisfying was knowledge work. I enjoyed looking for news, he told me. For this, he had to, quote, do a lot of research for my language because it was a Kikuyu broadcast. This allowed Wakadia to, quote, interact with the people and to go to meetings. And this brought him access. After I joined the information department, he told me, especially when people liked me so much, the elders called me to sit with them. This research, he explained, allowed him to go into the culture. This ethnographic work, Wakadia then broadcast first over the loudspeakers and later over the airwaves, calling together a community bounded by language and culture to him through his Kikuyu broadcast. Radio broadcasting, I'm trying to suggest here, um, offered Wakadia a modality of future making, and I'll, and I'll um, sort of dive further into this in a moment here. The future that Wakadia imagined, however, was not the global village of Marshall McLuhan. Rather, and to return to Nelson, Wakadia's project did not simply mobilize technologies to access radically new ideas about self and identification, but looked backward and forward in seeking to provide insights about identity in the process defying the linear teleology embedded in colonial technoculture. But neither was this future bounded by the borders of an aspired for nation state. As Wakadia told me, one thing we did not understand was independence to tell you the truth. What was independence? Kenyatta was telling us about independence, but what was independence? We never knew it. We were just always saying, yes, we fight. We didn't know independence until after we got it. Both the synchro synchronous time of the nation state and the homogenous time of the globalized media world were at odds with the cultural time that Wakadia sought to enact over the airwaves. 
His was the time of, a of the conditional future rooted in a timeless past that had been violently interrupted by colonial occupation and the missionary project. In his own words, radio research afforded him the opportunity to go, quote, back into the dark days of the Kikuyu through a knowledge. I don't know where it came from. I left my family. I went into the Kikuyu, into the culture, into the ceremonies, and even more. What Wakadia sought to understand were the forms of action and comportment that would enable men to achieve wiafi, the Kikuyu term uh, that translates to self mastery, which is the kind of um, uh, the kind of fullest articulation of adult masculinity. Wakadia, following Jane Geyer, was engaged in a cultural project that drew on legacies, those elements seen as or known to be inherited from the past, which give them an aura of endurance. And that endurance could be both enhanced and put to work. Um, and as, as I'll explain, I, I think that we need to understand this kind of sense of the timelessness of the past as being um, responses to or rooted in the, in the predicaments of the present. For Wakadia, Mau Mau was a two front war, a battle to regain lands and a fight to revivify a culture in decline. Radio afforded him just such an opportunity. The boundaries of kikuyu were hardened in the process. For Wakadia, Kikuyu culture exists in the singular and it was through the medium of radio that he claimed for himself the position of authority on all things Gakuyu. And this brought him fame. I was a big man, by the way. I was a boss, an information assistant, ABS, African Broadcasting Services, driving in that car. Ooh, I loved it, he explained. Knowledge workers like Wakadia then routinely turned their positions um, within the information arm of the colonial state into ones from which they could pursue their vocations, not simply advocates of administrative efforts to sort of end uh, the war or win the war against Mau Mau, but as purveyors and authors of culture. In this then they reformulated their prosthetic work, appropriating the form of new media for themselves as their own prosthetics. Radio broadcasting, they reformatted into a tool that they could put to work calling to order new audiences. Wakadia was elusive about the pr precise cultural knowledge he deployed during Mau Mau or in the period immediately following it. However, something of the future's past that he imagined can be gleaned from the knowledge work he was pursuing over the radio um, when I was interviewing him in the 2010s. When I interviewed Wakadia for a second time in 2014, his narrative slipped easily between past and present. In the present, like in the past, he uses his role as a broadcaster as a means of suturing listeners to their culture. In the present, like in the past, many fear Kikuyu are on the brink of cultural loss. When Wakadi is not producing broadcasts, he uses his status as a venerated radio personality to advocate for the project of cultural renewal being argued for most forcefully by the Kikuyu Council of Elders. These men of wealth and power, these social adults, and I can uh, speak more about the centrality of this, um, have, have set for themselves the task of revivifying what to them appears to be a cultural inheritance under attack. When we spoke, Wakadia explained that the youth have gone astray. These men of 30 to 35 years old are social children, mere boys in Wakadia's framing. Their social immaturity is indexed by the fact that they have pursued paths of listless waywardness. Um, Wakadia linked their deviance to the collapse of white collar work. These men uh, by and large were educated for futures in white collar professions um, and they have turned to drink and drugs waiting for futures that will never be theirs. In the context of this changed economy, Wakadia told me they have found that they are educated fools. Critically, this foolishness is tightly bound to their perceived uh, disrespect for elders. One of the key, key symbols of their insubordination is evident in their consumption of alcohol, which they drink without paying due diligence to generational hierarchies. Wakadia was emphatic that he never would have dreamed of consuming Muratina, uh, Gakuyu beer, without the permission, without the invitation 
of um, his father or grandfather. While this declension narrative might appear to be closely linked to ma the material transformations that came on the heels of structural adjustment um, beginning in the 1980s and you know, through to the present, Wakadia's narrative positions this moment at bus but the most recent in a long line of attacks on Gokuyi culture. The first attack he located as coming on the coattails of Christianity. While Wakadia self-identifies as a quote, true Christian, he is adamant that the church did us something very bad. Its main violence for, for Wakadia um, was the work that it undertook to quote, change the Kikuyu in their culture. Kikuyu are unique from Wakadia's perspective in this problematic of cultural decline. Um, uh, and this for him is, is by virtue of their early conversion. As he explained, it is only the Kikuyu who are lost. We might uh, recall here the early familial conflicts that structured Wakadia's own life. This process of cultural dilution was echoed during Mau Mau when male de detainees were separated from their wives and placed in detention camps. This led to polluting cultural mixture, according to Wakadia, as non Kikuyu men were relocated to Kikuyu locations, and these others, and his, I'm using his language here, produced with the Kikuyu women. And so men, quote, returning from detention would find their wives with children and they were left wondering. According to Wakadia, this was an explicit tactic of the British designed to quote, finish Kikuyu. The trouble uh, started then also, he told me. While the British were not successful in destroying Kikuyu culture, they did deep damage. And yet he said, we still survive. For Wakadia, this declension narrative continues into the present, but it is actively being rolled back by people like him, a cultural expert who is at the center of what he actively refers to as a campaign. The culture, he told me, it's coming back now, it's coming back. It would require time, perhaps another 50 years, he speculated, but the cultural inheritances of Kikuyu people would be restored to them. This required that men and women, boys and girls be re educated in Kikuyu culture. I teach men, I teach women, he told me. I bring them together. Much of this happens over the radio where listeners call in to consult Wakadia over correct his language Kikuyu practice. As though untouched by time, it is over the radio that Wakadia explains to them their cultural inheritances. Over the airwaves, these inheritances will be restored and the Kikuyu, um, he told me, will find themselves correct, find themselves standing straight. Um, there is more to be said here about like how, how to sort of think about um, this interview material uh, based on conversations that happened in 2014 in relation to his memories of, of um, Mau Mau and, and also the ways that Mau Mau has sort of been re, re, uh, recu recuperated in recent years. And maybe that's something we can discuss in, in the Q&A. Ensuring that today's youth take the path to attaining Wiafi, this concept of self-mastery, requires closely monitoring the moment of circumcision. It is here that cultured men are born. For this reason, Wakadia routinely attends circumcision ceremonies. Sometimes I stay with them for about two days, teaching them what is circumcision? What should they do after circumcision? He is busy in this venture. I'm booked every week, he told me. While Wakadia spoke to me in English, it is essential that this cultural knowledge be tr transmitted in Kikuyu. For Wakadia, um, like for the missionaries, uh, language is where culture lies. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a, a few moments to conclude here. The colonial state hoped to weaponize radio broadcasting in the face of what it called Mau Mau. For the administration, radio broadcasting um, was to shore up the parameters of a faltering colonial space in the context of an uncertain present. Theirs was the fractured time of imperial unraveling. Men like Wakadia and like the myriad other unnamed translators of techniques and culture were critical to this task. Long histories of colonial austerity ensured this would be the case. Radio broadcasting simply could not work as it worked in the metropole. Knowledge workers and technical experts asserted their autonomy in the borders of this lumpy information apparatus in both technical and cultural terms. 
However, as they occupied these interstitial but critical spaces, knowledge workers routinely turned their positions within the information arm of the colonial state into ones from which they could pursue their vocations, not simply as advocates of government propaganda, but as purveyors of, and authors of culture, um, cultures that they simultaneously saw as timeless um, and under threat from the transformations of late colonialism. In this, they appropriated the form of these new media for themselves as their own prosthetics, reformatting radio broadcasting in a tool that they could put to work in calling to order new audiences, audiences increasingly bound by language and culture. But theirs was neither the time of the nation state nor the time of the interconnected and flattened world that some media studies scholars might have us imagine. Indeed, they often refused these pretenses to universality or these scales um, of connection. As Wakadia reflected, recalling Radio Cairo's Swahili language broadcasts to Mau Mau, Gamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt faltered because it appealed to the generic category of Africans. This was not how Wakadia identified. His was a project of culture building that held and holds Kukuyunis at its center. Indeed, as these cultural architects work to root globally circulating technologies and media forms within narratives of cultural rejuvenation, they sought to secure one vision of the past um, as the singular vision for the future in, in the context of their fractured present. If in part, the racism underwriting colonial domination turned on the supposed imbrication of whiteness and technologies, a teleology driven by colonial capitalism, racism, and a linear vision of technological progress, the voices and daily work of African knowledge workers and experts offers different quote stories to tell about culture, technology, and things to come. But to get at these alternative narratives of technology and future making, we must plumb down into obscured zones and read sources for their silences. As Mark Derry writes, if there is an Afrofuturism, it must be sought in unlikely places, constellated from far flung points. It is at these far flung points that I have tried to argue here today, the technological autonomy of African knowledge workers and experts becomes visible. This technological, this technological work, as I've tried to show, was more than simply making do, but was a form of expertise and a modality of future making, which operated according to different tempos um, and with different material and ideational coordinates. But the concept of Afrofuturism Afro offers us other opportunities, which I've only just gestured toward here. And so I'm, I'm gonna just suggest one and then I'll, and then I'll wrap. If technologies bear with them histories and ideologies of violence and expropriation, locating the expertise of knowledge workers and experts offers us the opportunity to rescript the relationships among technology, modernity, capitalism, and colonialism. The stakes of this move, I think, continue to be pertinent. Today, as in the colonial period, Africa largely continues to be portrayed as a place outside of the march of histories of technological progress. We need new histories that, quote, account for the centrality of Black people's labor in modernization and industrialization, as well as the historical truths of Black participation in technological development, end quote. To conclude then, I think that Afrofuturism offers a provocation um, to historians of Africa. It is a call for us to conjoin histories of political, political economy with histories of technological action. This is a call, in other words, for us to think through the possibilities that histories of technology um, might reveal about the histories of capitalism and expropriation, including the expropriation of African technological skill on the continent. Um, because the story I have uh, told today, um, while, while past, I, I, I don't think that um, some of the underwriting premises have passed. Thank you very much. I am going to stop share. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. I will stop the recording too.